Hi, and welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and his love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into his word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along his path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Morning, everyone. Sorry about that. I was watching the clock, and apparently our clock is not correct. <laughs> so, welcome everyone online. So good that you can be here with us, uh, and thank you for everyone for coming. It is a great day to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, today I just have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, let's see. Oh, before we get started, I should tell you who I am. I am Pastor Mindy, the children's pastor here, and I am so glad to get to be up here and joining you guys as part of this worship. Our children's ministry is still joining us here in the sanctuary. Uh, make sure your kids get their boxes out in the, the front area there. All right, announcements. We have uh, coming up soon a movie night and worship night for all the families. And that is going to be September 19th at 7 uh, p.m. here at the church in our back uh, lot. So uh, start planning for that. There we go. we got a slide up there. So save that date. More information will be coming so that you can uh, plan to attend that. should be a, a really great time so that we can just come together and fellowship. Uh, for those of you that are here live on your way in, you probably saw all the chalk drawings out there. Yesterday we hosted a leadership uh, training for the American Heritage Girls. Uh, that is a scouting troop that we host here at the church. We also have Trail Life, which is boys. And starting September 14th, there will be an open house. So if you're interested for your children, come out and check that out here at the church. Uh, let's see. Also, if you would like to worship this morning by giving your tithes and offering, you can go online on the, our website and give online so that you do not have to give up that act of worship. Or on your way out, for those that are here, there is a box in the north or in the lobby. Okay. Well, uh, stand with me now as we uh, join in worship and as I read the scripture. Sing to the Lord a new song because he has done wonderful things. His own strong hand and his own holy arm have won the victory. The Lord has made his salvation widely known. He has revel, uh, revealed his righteousness in the eyes of all the nations. God has remembered his loyal love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Every corner of the earth has seen our God's salvation. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Be happy. Rejoice out loud. And sing your praises. Yes, indeed. Sing your praises to the Lord with the with the lyre and with the lyre and the sound of music. Yes. With trumpets and the horn blast, shout triumphantly before the Lord, the King. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mindy. Let's 
Let's all raise a hallelujah. What do you say?
Amen. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and be seated. Hallelujah. It's good to be together together today uh, here at First Church for worship, and uh, I'm excited to, to see all of you. Um, just wanted to quickly share with you what some of the students have been doing uh, this week. Uh, about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, we started a service project at, uh, at the home of Vivian Stifler, and uh, through various circumstances, we weren't able to finish it. And so uh, a, a, a crew went back this Thursday and removed all the, the shaker shingles off of her gazebo, and there were thousands of staples. What I thought was going to take a little, we didn't get the staples off till like 4.30. It was, <laughs> and so, uh, so we, we put new sheeting back up, uh, uh, started that on Thursday. And then, uh, then Friday, uh, we, we had put in a basketball pole that we got from Vivian's house because she wanted it removed. So we put it, uh, put it up on Friday with a couple other students. And then some more students went back to her uh, place yesterday with uh, Jason Fischel uh, and removed like, what, eight, eight bushes, nine bushes, and, and then finished putting uh, the roof uh, on the gazebo. It still needs shingles, but everything else is buttoned up. And so they've been working hard, and uh, just uh, uh, we've been thrilled to be able to do that for you, Vivian. And so I know just uh, having things unfinished, you have now have your yard back. It's tranquil. We're not there. Uh, but uh, but uh, we were just so delighted to be able to serve you and bless you and your family uh, with that. And so just a shout-out to the students that, that helped complete that project. It was, it was good. They enjoyed doing it as well. Uh, as we go to a time of prayer this morning, uh, I just want to, to lift up a, a, one of our missionaries. Uh, we're gonna, we always lift up a missionary each week, but I also wanted to add, add one this week for Danny Lopez and his family in Guatemala. Their family all has COVID. And the, most of the family is doing well, but it hit Danny hard, hardest, right? And so, so he's having a little rougher time than, than the rest of the family. So, so be praying for Danny and, and his family uh, down in Guatemala. And so um, uh, won't you uh, uh, join me as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Lord, I, I give you uh, a shout of hallelujah for being uh, a God who cares about all the things in life. Lord, we thank you for your love and compassion for us. We thank you first and foremost uh, for your son, Jesus, uh, for he is the one that, uh, that has restored our relationship to you. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that he has done for us. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit uh, that is with us every day when we come and accept your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we are not alone. And, uh, and so, Lord, and neither is Danny and his family. Uh, in, in this time of, of experiencing COVID in, uh, in a real way. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, see them through this, that you would give them strength uh, and so that they can get about doing the ministry uh, that they have such a passion for, of sharing uh, Christ with people uh, in Guatemala. So bless them and encourage them. I also want to lift up to you uh, Paul and Katia Jones in Bolivia and just ask that you would continue uh, to to encourage them in their ministry there. We thank you for their passion and for their family and even for the, their daughter who uh, does uh, some singing and uh, has a music ministry. Lord, we just ask that you would bless them all, uh, that you would help provide the resources that are required uh, to be able to reach people uh, in, in a foreign land. And Lord, I also just thank you for the church and how we are a family. And, and this morning, I just bring to you Don and Judy Beringer and Sarah Bittner and Mark Bland, and Lord, we thank you that each one of them has a, a strong faith. And Lord, uh, we just pray today that you would meet each one of them at their point of need, because Lord, we all have needs, uh, and, and we could need a, a, a use a touch from you. And so Lord, I ask that you would do that this morning, that they would uh, sense your presence uh, fully alive in, in their lives. And Lord, I also just uh, thank you for this time of worship that we have together. Uh, Pastor Josh is uh, starting a new series, and and uh, and it's about spiritual depression. And so, Lord, it's it's a real thing, and uh, and so, Lord, may we learn uh, from your word today through Pastor Josh, uh, Lord, that you would uh, just help us to become uh, healthy, mature, strong Christians, and uh, Lord, that we would might be able to in turn uh, encourage others. 
And Lord, we also just thank you for the offerings that have been received from week to week and the offering that's uh, going to be received this week. Lord, we ask that you would bless it to, to strengthen your church here in Talmadge and also, uh, uh, you know, around our community and around the world. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of this church as they give. And now may we give you our all as we continue to worship you in all of your glory, your holiness, and truth. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Stand and worship with us. I can see waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea, lives in us, lives in us. Lives in us, lives in us. We have hope that his promises are true. In his strength, there is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overtaken. Same power that 
Father, as we come to you this morning, we do acknowledge that you are perfect in all of your ways, and so we have risen a hallelujah to you. We have remembered right now that the same power that rose you from the dead lives in us, and so I pray, Father, right now, that as we come to you and we open your word, your spirit-inspired word together, that we would be moved by you, changed by you, encouraged by you, and prompted by you to be more faithful to you. And in Jesus' name we pray, all God's people said... Amen, amen. You may be seated. Lexi Walker, a 47-year-old professional fiduciary who lives near Greenville, South Carolina, has felt anxious and depressed for long stretches of this year. She moved back to South Carolina late in 2019 
but then her cat died. Her father passed away in February, just when she thought she'd get out and socialize in an attempt to heal from her grief, the pandemic hit. It's been one thing after another, Walker said. This is very hard. The worst thing about this for me, after so much, I don't know what's going to happen. That was an experience shared in an article on June 16th published by the Associated Press. The title of the article was, Americans are the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. When you read, you discover why. We obviously uh, have fallen on some difficult times, and as you read through the article, what you discover is that people generally aren't real hopeful for the future. And to be honest, hope is rooted in a positive outlook on the future. When you are hopeful, you have a positive outlook on the future. You think something good is going to happen in the future. And right now, a majority of our uh, um, country men, country women, uh, are, uh, the, the, the people that we live around are fearful of the future. Americans are afraid of the future right now. The AP shared a little more of their findings about life in the pandemic. They said the public is less optimistic today about the standard of living improving for the next generation than it has been in the past 25 years. Only 42% of Americans believe that when their children reach their age, their standard of living will be better. A solid 15% or 57% said that all of this in 2018, that things would get better for their children in the future. Now, on the other hand, 42% say that things will not get better in the future. And by the way, this was, this was before George Floyd. This was before any of that. This article was published. You saw a 15-point swing and the way that we view the future over the past two years. And as we get into spiritual depression here, what I want you to know is that fear of the future can cause spiritual depression. While at the same time, we all have to face the future. We all have to deal with our futures. And we don't want to remain in a spiritual depression. We don't want to remain unhappy. We don't want to remain, as, as the older theologians or doctors used to say, in melancholy. We may not know what the future holds, but we have to learn how to face it, and we have to learn how to deal with it. I, I want to introduce you to two people before I read the text for you this morning that I, I want to show you and kind of use as our outline for our teaching and really for the application. The first is a man named Paul. Many of you are very familiar with Paul. If you read your Bible, if you, especially if you read your New Testament, if you're part of the church, right, you've heard me read Paul's writings a lot. You've heard me talk about Paul. Well, Paul is somebody I want to introduce to you, but I just don't want to introduce him to you. I want to introduce his current context to you. Paul has gotten older at this point in time. He is in Rome. His goal was to take the gospel to Rome and then eventually get to Spain. Uh, for them, he, they kind of saw the ends of the earth as Spain. He was just going to kind of continue and spread the gospel and keep going. Well, Paul finds himself at this point as he's writing to a man named Timothy, who I will talk about here in a second, he finds himself in prison in Rome, not for the first time, but for the second time here as he's writing to Timothy. And Paul basically is, uh, we believe, most people believe, he's probably seeing kind of the writing on the wall here, that his life is probably going to come to an end in prison. He's probably either going to die in prison or they are going to execute him at some point in time. And so for Paul, as he writes to Timothy, his, his outlook is bleak, right? <laughs> it's just not looking good for him. The, the, his future is not what most of us would want for our own lives. So Paul pretty much, for the most part, as he's sitting in this prison, and he probably knows kind of what awaits him, his basically plan, although he knows God can change those plans, but his, his plan is probably to, to die in prison. He believes that this letter that he is writing to Timothy will probably be his last letter to Timothy. Now, let me introduce you to Timothy. Timothy was a man that Paul helped mentor in the faith. 
Paul was involved in a place called Ephesus, and the Christian church was uh, spreading throughout Ephesus, and Timothy is one of the leaders in Ephesus. If you read through Timothy, what you'll discover is Timothy was one of the younger leaders in Ephesus, and Paul poured into him, and Paul was an encourager in Timothy's life, as Timothy dealt with what would be like a lot of false teachers. You know, you think that our culture is difficult to deal with when it comes to Christianity. Well, Timothy's was much worse. It just was. And it was hard to formulate a church and get churches together and keep people unified because false teachers would come into the church and they would try to go off and do their own thing and they would teach things that weren't true and weren't right. And it's part of Timothy's job as, as even as a younger man to make sure that people understood what the gospel was, what, the, what, what Jesus taught and what should be taught in their churches. And so Timothy's, one of Timothy's jobs is to keep the church united and he also doesn't want to be sent to jail and put on the top chopping block. And so Paul is writing to him, trying to encourage him, and Timothy is trying to keep everything straight. And he realizes during the, all of this that probably his sounding board, the person that he would go to in times of trouble, is no longer going to be around. And so I believe as you read through these letters that Paul sends to Timothy, Timothy is probably very fearful about Paul's fate because Timothy, for two reasons, Timothy wants Paul around so he knows what to do. And second, Timothy knows that he could suffer from the same fate that Paul suffers from if he continues to do what Paul has called him to do. And so Timothy has the same outlook potentially for his future as he looks at Paul. And he's wondering if he is going to have the ability to lead without Paul and the strength to lead without Paul around. So that's the context of this letter. Paul is writing to Timothy. So these are Paul's words, the older man in ministry to the younger man in ministry. And this is what he tells Timothy as Timothy is relatively fearful of the future at the moment. Here it is. And this is what he says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So what does Paul tell Timothy here about fear? First thing I want you to see, he's relatively clear about this. And it's this, is that fear, fear of the future is not from God. Fear of the future, according to Paul, who is sitting in prison, <laughs> awaiting death, is not from God. Timothy fears the future. Paul is in prison, and he is making it clear, fear of the future is not from God. So if fear of the future is not from God, where does it come from? If you were with us here two weeks ago, I started this series two weeks ago, I recommend that you actually go back and listen to that or watch that if you haven't, because we, we talk about where some of the roots of uh, spiritual depression come from. I'm going to talk about two according to fear. One is a review from two weeks ago, but it's important that we get to the sources of the, the, the areas of our life that keep us down and that keep us from enjoying the joy of the Lord, keep us from being and becoming who we should become and getting through the circumstances that God promises to get us through the way that he promises uh, to get us through them. And so where, where does fear come from if it's not from God? Here is one of the places that it comes from, right here. It's your temperament. What I mean by this is I mean your personality. That's, that's what I mean. Some people are, are more likely to be fearful than other people. I, I would just tell you this. I, I've been here for about seven years now. Many of you have been here the entire time I've been here. If, right, something kind of bad happens in a particular person's life, or just if in the life of our church we decide to kind of maybe do something a little different, to make a little change, I can tell you who is going to come to me right, and tell me all of the reasons that they don't think it's a good idea or that they're fearful that it might not work, right? I can just tell you that, and I'm not saying that those people aren't good Christians and that I don't respect them and that I don't want that to happen necessarily. Sometimes people come with some legitimate concerns that we haven't thought about, right, and, and so it can be helpful, but I also know that many of those people, they just operate 
out of fear a lot of times. It's just kind of, it's kind of built into them, right? You're just more prone to be fearful. You're more cautious by your very nature. It's, it's your predisposition to a certain extent. So any change in your life, any transition can sometimes cause an extreme amount of worry and anxiety. Sometimes this is connected deep kind of just within your personality. Just kind of, well, you were just almost kind of born that way. Sometimes it's because you've had things happen to you in the past that has even changed the way you look at the future and what could happen in the future. And so you're just, a, a, you're just kind of a, a more afraid than other people uh, might be generally throughout your life. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. People in the church are like this. And even different situations cause us to fear at different times. Paul himself, the writer of 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, in this case that we've been talking about, he had fears in his life. There are times in his life where he was prone to fear. There were times in his life where he lacked self-confidence and even lacked faith. Paul, when he goes to the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church, we want to talk about a church that was just messed up and an awful culture. Read through 1 and 2 Corinthians, right? And you'll think the culture that we're living in is relatively tame. You'll think the church... the The problems our church have are relatively small. Well, when Paul shows up to the Corinthians and the Corinthian church, here's what he tells them in chapter 2, or or writes about in chapter 2 when he writes back to them. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Paul, this great preacher, great writer, a guy who understood Jesus' teaching, understood God, understood the power of God, probably better than any of us in this room, goes to people, and he said, when I came to you, I was afraid. I was afraid. I I didn't know if you would receive my message that I had for you. I didn't know what you would do to me. I didn't know how you would treat me. I didn't know if I would plant a church or what would happen there. I came to you afraid. The second thing or place that you might, might cause you fear, a root of one of your fear, and this is probably what many of you probably just kind of think about when you become afraid, is you're afraid of the task at hand. You're afraid of a task. Anything in front of you, anything that's kind of before you, you're, you're afraid of it. And what you're really afraid is not the task, but you're afraid of failing at the task, right? You're afraid of letting down your cause, of it not going the way that you hoped it would go. You're pouring your life out into it, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. Right? Not reaching that goal. If you read the article that I talked about in the Associated Press there, what you discover is that Americans generally have thought in their past that their children will do better than them. That's part of kind of the American dream, isn't it? And what you discover now is that the task at hand to create a better country, to create a better future for our children, in general, right, the general population at large doesn't see that as something that we are going to accomplish. Or at least we're getting more skeptical about it. Here are some maybe tasks that you're just afraid of. We just want to name these, right? Put them out there. Maybe it's providing for your family. You've been sent home because of coronavirus or you don't know what's going to happen. You're not sure if you're going to be able to keep your job or how the business you're working for is going to do. And so maybe you're afraid of providing for your family in the future. Maintaining relationships. I I don't know about you, but this has been one of the most difficult times in my life to maintain relationships. Not only will people not do, certain people not want to be around me, right? Because I'm dangerous potentially. I might have the virus. I might not. But I've got opinions about whether or not people should and shouldn't wear masks, right? Uh, in politics, right? do we even want, you even want to talk about that with people and try to maintain a relationship right now? Right? Uh, uh, maybe you're fearful of maintaining relationships that matter to you. What about just making your business work? More and more you read, it seems like small businesses continue to fail. Getting through school. Maybe you're a kid and you're trying to figure out, like, okay, how are we going to get through school? Are we even going to go to school? Is it going to work? You're a teacher. Um, I'm going to get the virus from the kids. I'm going to spread it so much. How, how is that going to work? Maybe you're trying to go back to college, and college is not the same. It's just not. 
you're not going to have the experience, so what's that going to do to is this my future outlook? Am I going to go to college and I'm going to pay all this money and I'm going to be on all this debt and what kind of jobs are going to be out there? Not living out my Christian life. Are you afraid of that? Am I equipped to do that? You might ask yourself, leading my group, I, I know there are growth group leaders in our church how am I supposed to lead? We don't know if we can get together. We don't know who we're will, who's willing to do it, how to start, any of that. Now, all of these are legitimate concerns that we have. And you, you, you might have different concerns in your life, right? That's not on this list. There are plenty of concerns about the future. Uh, and they're probably legitimate. But w- w- what we all need to know, right, even if we have legitimate concerns, if we are controlled by our fear of the future... These concerns and the way that they control us are not from God. They're not from God. And for some of you, maybe here this morning, or you're watching, or you're listening, uh, you are being controlled by your fear of your future, and it is actually causing a spiritual depression. You are having trouble in your relationship with the Lord, and you're feeling down, and you're feeling troubled, and you don't know what to do about it. And some of you might even be saying, Josh, well, we have to worry about the future. We have to think uh, about the future. And of course you do. Of course you do. It is not bad to think about the future. It is not bad to prepare for the future. It's not bad to work for the future. Our jobs are, even as Christians, to try to shape a better future. You should be about that. You should do that. You know this. I want to read you a proverb here, and I think just many Christians are really understand this, and we work for this. And here's what it says. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. Right? In other words, right, if you plan for the future, if you work hard, you'll probably do well as a general rule. This is a truism. That's what proverbs are. So it says it's good to plan for the future, but the Bible is very clear about this. It's bad to worry about the future. It's good to plan for the future. It's bad to worry about the future. It shows a lack of faith in God. God is always trying to get us to a more faithful position in our lives and to show faith. And this is why fear causes spiritual depression, because it separates us from our faith rooted in God. It's a departure from trust in God. It is. So you have to plan. Planning is a good thing. You have to plow for a good future. Those are good things. However, it's not for you to worry about the result of your crop. So you have to plow, but it's not good for you to worry about the result of your crop. Now, I did something this past week because when I think about planning for the future, I think about Proverbs. It's just what I, I think about. Like, there have to be a lot of Proverbs just about planning for the future and what it means to plan for the future. If you plan for the future, if you work hard now, like, it'll produce something later. And I was actually surprised about the way the Proverbs actually talks about the future most often. Just talk about it that way. I just showed you a proverb like that. But there are many Proverbs that actually talk about the future in this way that I want us to see. I'm going to give you three here. First, it's this. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. In other words, we have to give God charge of our plans. Your plans have to belong to God. So you make plans, but as you make them, as you think about the future, as you're worried about the future, you have to give those plans and that future to God if you're going to do it in the way that we should go about it. Continuing in this chapter, in Proverbs 16, 9, it says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So, get this. (laughs) Even if you don't give your plans to God, (laughs) he is going to take them from you. (laughs) So you should give your plans to God. If you don't give your plans to God, he is going to take them over. Third thing I want you to see here in Proverbs is many of the plans, many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So God's purpose for you, no matter what you plan, no matter your outlook on the future, is ultimately going to prevail in your life. 
So our job is to back up in the Proverbs and do this. Ready? <laughs> Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not to lean on our own understanding. Proverbs, I, I, I didn't put it in here. I should take you back even further. Proverbs 1. Right? <laughs> do, not, do not fear man, but fear God and seek his wisdom. Here. So Dr. Lloyd-Jones, um, who has helped me kind of think about this series here, he has this to say when you think about the future. Although it is very right to think about the future, it is very wrong to be controlled about it, to be controlled by it. Why? It's because God controls our future. Let God control our future. Let God have our future. Let our future be governed by God and let our, our, our present be given to him. Place your faith in him in this moment, right now. Jesus, this is what Jesus taught. Right? He doesn't want you to, to worry about an unknown future that you don't completely control. Here's what he says in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. He says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, in other words, what Jesus is saying, for the Gentiles, for those who don't trust in God, that's what they worry about. They worry about this, this material future that they might have. He says, instead, seek after who, who, th these Gentiles, those who don't trust in God, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need him, them all. So your heavenly Father knows that you worry about the future, know, knows what you need in the future, but seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's purpose for your life. Just seek that first. Trust in the king of the kingdom is what he's saying. He says, you're not the king. Right? President Trump is not the king. The next president, whether it be President Trump or Biden, will not be the king. They will not be the king. Trust in the kingdom of God, that king, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus goes on to say, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What Jesus teaches us is if you trust in anyone, including yourself, outside of Jesus, there will always be plenty to fear about. And God did not call you, God called you, by the way, into his kingdom. And God did not call you into his kingdom and to be about the king to worry and to be fearful about your future when the King, Jesus, holds your future in his hands. Got that. Now, let's return to First Timo or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Because God has given us, God has given us tools to combat fear. I want to share two of them with you this morning, because the third I'm probably going to focus on entirely next week. Here are the tools that God has given us to combat fear. The first is of power, the second is love, and the third is self-discipline. So here's what I want you to know about fear and the power that God has given us. Here's where what fear does. The spirit of fear will have you focus on your inability to control the future. While the Holy Spirit is the power of God working in you to navigate the future. The Holy Spirit is the power of God working in you to navigate an unsure, uncontrollable, uh, unknown future. We fear, ultimately. I have times where I am fearful, ultimately, because I forget that the Holy Spirit is alive in me. I forget that God is in me. You forget that God is in you. We say, sing that song, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, right, is in me, right? He lives in me. He lives in you. You are, let me just tell you this, you are a spirit-filled Christian. You do not become a Christian without the Holy Spirit entering into your life and prompting you to become a believer, prompting you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. You do not follow Jesus, you do not love Jesus, you do not worship Jesus without the Spirit of God being in you. You can't. Right? That's what it looks like to, when, if, if you are like the, the, the people in 
Ezekiel where there's the valley of dead bones, dry bones. It's to be people without the presence of God. You have the presence of God. You have the Spirit of God living in you. You are a Spirit-filled Christian. You have been born again. You are a child. God is alive in you. He is. He is. And if that is true, when you find yourself feeling fearful, you will approach your fear differently. You will have to remind yourself then that the Spirit of God is in me. He's in me. He's with me. And I see this future that I, 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 may, not, I may not like it. I, I may project that it is not going to be the future that I will prefer in my life. But you must see it as a new challenge for the work of God in you. Not only the work of God in you, but the work of God through you. So when you see that, you say, God, I don't know why you're going to lead me in this direction. I don't know why you're going to lead our country in this direction. I don't know why you're going to lead my family in this direction. I, I don't know why you're leading my business in this direction. I don't know any of that. But I know that through this, that you are going to do a new work in me. And you're going to do a new work through me. So if you fear the future, you have got to ask yourself, God, what are you going to do in me at this moment and in the future? Ask yourself that question. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. You might not get a direct answer. But the good news is, is that if you are acknowledging that the Spirit of God is with you, in you, walking with you, challenging you, changing you, molding you, you will be able to approach that situation in a completely different way than you had before. Because you will see the Spirit of God at work in your life. You will see the way that your Redeemer actually lives in you. And you will be able to see His work in those moments. You might have to tell yourself or even speak back to God, I do not know what the future holds, but I know you are a part of my future and you promise to do a new work in me. You promise to do work in others through me. He does. He does. And so as you think about the future, and if you're generally afraid of it, or you find yourself becoming fearful, right, don't think about your own weakness and confronting that future. You need to tap into God's power. You need to think about God's power at that point. That's what you need to rely on. I think about Peter. Uh, Peter failed at this when Jesus was at the cross. So Peter is one of Jesus' best friends. Peter saw Jesus heal people firsthand. You, you, get, you get that, right? Like Peter is the person who he got out of the boat and he walked on water for a little while in front of Jesus. You would think that Peter has some confidence in Christ here. Well, when Jesus goes to the cross, <laughs> Jesus is on the cross, Peter denies Jesus three times. He, I, I, I don't know that guy. One of them was to a teenage girl, by the way. Right? Not a real manly thing to do. Uh, now, now, what changes that? Like, what, what changed Peter from somebody who is preaching? A, 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 a preacher, somebody who is writing scripture, somebody who is, who is laying down his life so that the gospel might go forward. Now, if some of you have heard me talk about this and have heard me teach about kind of what changes Peter's mind, some of you probably immediately think right, the resurrection. Peter saw the risen Jesus, and he did. And, and, and that's a, a great apologetic tool to tell people, right, and to teach people and, and get people to believe in the resurrection, the power of God to raise the dead. But really, when you think about it, what transformed Peter into a preacher? What gave Peter hope and what had Peter preaching about the future was actually Pentecost. It was when the Spirit of God was poured out on Peter and the people around him. It's not that he didn't see the resurrection, he did. But what gave Peter power to preach what gave Peter power to reach thousands of people, what gave Peter power to keep preaching when those thousands were no longer coming to Jesus and life started to get hard and he began to be persecuted was the Holy Spirit at work in his life. Peter became dependent on Jesus' spirit, on the spirit of God, on the Holy Spirit. That's what gave Peter power throughout his life. And he preached, and he did the work of God until eventually he was martyred. Tradition has it that actually Peter was crucified upside down. So let me just ask you, right? what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of change? 
Well, God's going to do new, a new work in you. God is going to do a new work in you. Are you afraid of failure? Well, tell yourself, the Spirit of God is in me. Are you pr- afraid of not being able to provide for yourself or your family? Remind yourself, God is my provision. What about being judged? Well, if I do this, if I say this, if I go here. <laughs> you are justified and forgiven by God. You are righteous and being made righteous. Go make mistakes. <laughs> go out there. Right? Don't be afraid. Take some risk if you need to, to do what God has called you to do. Are you, are you afraid of losing control? Tell yourself you already surrendered that to God. Are you afraid of who you are becoming? The Spirit of God can change you. Are you afraid of death? The Spirit of God is going to raise you with the same power that he rose Jesus Christ. God gives us that Spirit. We have that power, and we must use it. We must remind ourselves of it. So the first thing that Paul reminds Timothy of when he tells him that fear is not from God, I'm not talking about foolishness here, just to be clear, but that fear is not from God, but instead he has given us power, he's given us the Holy Spirit power. The second thing that Timothy says that he has given us is love. He's given us love. And here's why. Fear will always have you focusing on yourself. This is what fear does. I call this navel-gazing, right? Has you look at yourself. Love has you focus on others. Gets you from here to here, right? Your spiritual depression, if you feel like you're in a spiritual depression, if you feel like fear is a part of it, it may actually be because of an over-obsession on yourself. It may be because you are over-obsessed about yourself and what might happen to you. And the spirit of love actually delivers us from the spirit of self-love and self-concern only. Now, what I am not saying is that you should hate yourself. I am not saying that. Jesus loves you. (laughs) You should love you. You just should not be absorbed with yourself. Self-love should should not be the thing that controls you. But rather, our love for God and our love for other people. Jesus, as he was going throughout his life, he knew that he was loved by God. He knew that the Father loved him. So Jesus didn't have to go around showing everybody how much God loved him. No. What Jesus was able to do is he was freed by the love of God because he knew he was loved by God to go and love other people. And so Jesus' ministry was primarily spent showing other people how much God loved them and how much he loved them. Jesus' death and his resurrection were about the love of God. Jesus dies in our place because he loves us. Jesus rises from the dead because he wants to be with us and has prepared a place for us. The love of Christ is the way that we are supposed to live our life. We are supposed to love the way that Christ loved. What does Christ's love show us? How are we supposed to do this? We are supposed to sacrifice for other people. That's what we are supposed to, that's how we express our love as Christians. Jesus loved us so that we will love others. Jesus poured out his life so that we will pour out our lives for others and our love for them. So one of the keys of not fearing for your future is actually to make the present better for others. One of the keys of not fearing for your future is to make the present better for others. Some of you may have heard of Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell was known as the Flying Scotsman. In 1924, he won the 400-meter dash in the Summer Olympics. The crazy thing about that, though, is that he was not a 400 runner. He was a 100 runner, and he had to run the 400 because the 100 was run on a Sunday, and he refused to run on a Sunday. 
And so he told England that he would not run the 100, but that he would only run the 400. A lot of people did not want him to run the 400, only wanted him to run the 100 because they, that's what he was the best at. He was the best in the world at the 100 meter dash and nobody knew if he could win the 400 or not. And he said, well, I'm not gonna run the 100 if the 100 is on Sunday. And so he decides to run the 400. Any of you who know anything about track, those are two very different races. And yet he was athletic enough not only to be the best in the world at the 100, but he became the best in the world at the 400. You can imagine that this guy was a pretty good athlete. He was one of the top rugby players in England. After he won the Olympics, uh, or won the 400 in uh, 1924, he became a very sought-after speaker. People wanted him around. They wanted him to speak. They wanted him to travel around and, and be in front of people and to train with other Olympians and, and to talk about all of that. Well, sooner than a year after winning gold in the Olympics, he went to China, where his parents spent most of their lives as missionaries to return to work with the poor, the down and out, and those who did not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who had very little training with the Bible. And so he's there until 1941, and I want to read to you a little bit about Eric Liddell's life. In 1941, when the Second World War entered China, Liddell had an opportunity to go home to England. Instead, he decided to stay. He eventually, eventually, the Japanese took over the mission, and Liddell was placed in an internment camp where men, women, and children were, were treated horribly and starved. Now, people react in all sorts of ways when their present and future is bleak. Biographies about Liddell describe how, the rich biz, how rich businessmen in the camp joined together to develop a smuggling ring, ring for eggs and food that they kept for themselves. Liddell had to convince them to share with the women and children. Liddell's biographers, both Christian and not, describe many of the other Christian missionaries being no better than the rich businessmen. They were described as forming cliques who moralized and generally acted selfishly. Many of the missionaries spent most of their time criticizing the drunks, the gamblers, and the young people who caused trouble without lifting a finger to help to serve others in the camp while they were all in their time of desperation and depression. Liddell, on the other hand, decided to love others. He devoted himself to helping the elderly, teaching Bible classes at the camp school, arranging games and teaching science to the children because he had a science degree from Edinburgh. The children in the camp referred to Eric as Uncle Eric. Landon Gilkey, who also survived the camp and became one of the most prominent theologians in the United States, said this of Liddell. Often in an evening, I would see him bent over a chessboard or on a model boat or directing some sort of square dance, absorbed, weary, and interested pouring all of himself into this effort to capture the imagination of these penned-up youth. He was overflowing with good humor and love for life and with enthusiasm and charm. It is rare indeed to meet a such a person who, who has a good fortune to meet such a person, a saint. But he, ha he, has, he has come close to, as it is to being a saint as anybody I've ever known. Now, I wish I could tell you that Liddell survived this camp but he didn't. The former Olympian and missionary died in that camp from a brain tumor. However, Liddell didn't just die in that camp. He resolved to truly live for as long as he could. He lived through his love and he gave others life in that camp that was meant to dehumanize them. If you read about Liddell's life, about his time in this camp, you'll notice that he battled with depression and fear like each of us do. But what we see different in Liddell's life than in others is that he chose not to obsess over the self, but rather to show God's love to other people in his midst. Eric may have died in that camp, but while he was alive, he lived. He was not controlled by his fear, but by love. He focused on helping others, <laughs> on helping others live while they were going through difficult times. The spirit of love will have you create a better existence 
for others. So let me ask you this question, end with this question. Do you want to walk out of your fear of the future? Love like Liddell. He learned to love from Jesus. I believe that living without a paralyzing fear of the future is not out of reach for anybody in this room. It's not out of reach for any of us. The power of God is in us. He has given us this kind of love. We just need to be reminded of it. We need to remember it. We need to be compelled by it. That is true. That is truth. That is God's word for us. If this isn't true in your life, it can be. The way to make this true is to receive Christ as Savior. Christ has the power to do this in anybody's life for anybody who believes. Jesus died to show his perfect love. Jesus was risen in perfect power. And I believe that if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, that he is calling you to walk out of fear and calling you to himself in this moment. So I am asking you, to make Jesus your king, to make Jesus your savior, to make Jesus your Lord, to give Jesus your present and to give him your future. He can help you with this fear if you give him your life and receive his spirit and walk with him. I ask everybody to bow their heads and pray with me this morning. Father, you have not given us a a spirit of fear, but the power of love and of self-discipline. Father, and I pray right now for anybody here who's dealing with fear, we all deal with it from time to time. We do. It's part of being human. But I pray right now that if we are fearful of the future, if we came in with something on our heart or on our mind and it's controlling us, It's making life very difficult. We don't know what to do with it. I pray, Father, right now that your Holy Spirit would comfort us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that your Holy Spirit would console us, that your Holy Spirit would remind us that you are present in our problems. And I pray that we are reminded that we have your power in the midst of our problems, present and future problems. And that we would believe that you have an opportunity to use those problems. To be at work in our future. To change something in us that needs to be changed. To change something in our friend's life, family member's life, and our community's life that needs to be changed if you would work through us. And so we ask you, Father, that we would be reminded each and every day, each and every moment that your power is within us. For some of us, Father, we are fearful because we're fearful what's going to happen to us, to me. And I am not praying that anybody would be foolish in this room, but I am praying that they would be delivered from fear and that we would know how to love others well, that we would know how to create a better present for others that we would know how to show others how much that you love them in this present moment. That you would help us to walk out of ourselves and walk towards you. If there's anybody who may be watching or listening now or here this morning, Father, who who doesn't know what it's like to have you calm our fears, or anxieties. I pray that you would begin to do that in their life right now. I pray that you would call them to your son, Jesus Christ, that they would commit to follow you, that they would believe that you are good to them, that they would believe that your son, Jesus, is Savior, that they would believe that he has risen from the dead. 
that your spirit would do something supernatural in them right now. And they would confess you as Lord. And that you would remove that worry and that anxiety that is in them. Father, you are good. And we are thankful that we do not have to worry about tomorrow because you are the God of tomorrow. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We haven't been doing this a lot, and you can still do this in social distance if you want. Uh, maybe you have something that's been on your heart or on your mind, and you want to come to the altar and pray. Uh, I encur- I'm going to encourage you, uh, if somebody is at the altar and praying, we're still going to social distance, and so keep your distance from them. <laughs> but maybe there's something you want to pray about. As we sing this last song, the altars will be open before I come up and give our benediction and, and close this service. So you're welcome to come forward and use the altars. Praise team is just overjoyed to welcome a new member. Most of you know Michael, Michael Korbasevic. He has a wonderful voice, a wonderful spirit, and we're just glad to have him up here with us. Will you please stand and join us for one last song? we go. Because he lives. Amen. Amen. That is the truth. 
Well, as you uh, go here this morning, I just want to remind you how good it is to see you. Uh, no, and I mean that. It, it is good to see you. It's, it's weird not seeing a lot of the people that we are used to seeing. And so um, it's, I know some of you are here for the first time. And so it's good to see you. It was good yesterday. We saw the men, uh, some of the men for the men's breakfast. And it was good to see you all and spend time with you. Um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I obviously um, think fellowship is very important. But as we have in the past weeks, I am going to ask if you want to fellowship to make sure you do it outside. Uh, there's no, I don't want you to be fearful, but I also don't want you to be foolish. So we are asking that we, if we're going to fellowship, to do so outside. It's good to be with you here this morning. Let me leave you with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord watch over you and give you peace. Yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, God.